Welcome to Networking Fundamentals. This online program by Juniper Networks is designed as an introduction to how networks work, how they communicate information between computers, and, in the case of the Internet, how data, such as email messages, traverse the millions of miles of networks worldwide to end up at the correct computer. This program includes numerous interactive exercises to help communicate and reinforce the information. This program is about five hours long. When you think about it, it's amazing. You type a few keystrokes, click a few mouse clicks, and an email is sent nearly instantaneously across the world. Or you launch a web browser and type a URL, and a web page automatically appears. How does that happen? Today, networks impact all of us, from corporate workers collaborating on projects to grandparents exchanging photos with their grandchildren. But how many of us know how that email or photo gets from point A to point B, or how a simple URL gets to the correct web server. At its core, a network is simply the conduit one computer uses to send information to another computer. Add up all those conduits, though, and soon you begin to wonder how those millions of networks, all interconnected to form the Internet, manage to keep all that data straight. And considering there are billions of computers on the Internet, how is it possible that data manages to end up in the right place at all? In this program, we answer all these questions. We'll start with a generic model of how networks operate, specifically networks like the Internet, then discuss specific networking technologies and protocols. At the end, we combine this information and show you just how data gets from point A to point B. So let's get started. We just mentioned that a network is simply a conduit that connects at least two computers. In fact, the two devices don't need to be computers. A computer sending data to a shared printer is using a network. Of course, most networks are more complicated than that. Every business with more than a handful of employees has at least one network, which is what allows you to share a spreadsheet or document with a coworker. Large companies commonly have remote offices connected to corporate headquarters. Many homes are networked too, so your entire family can all share a single printer instead of buying printers for each computer. Finally, more and more people are using mobile devices to access email and the Internet. And while the details of each specific type of network are beyond the scope of this course, all networks, however simple or complicated, use the same fundamental concepts and building blocks. There are two basic kinds of networks. Any group of computers on a single geographically limited network is called a local area network or LAN. LANs allow users to exchange documents and share resources such as printers or file servers. A LAN can be either wired or wireless, or a combination of both. We discuss the different LAN components and how information is sent from one computer to another later in this course. LANs can be connected to other LANs by way of a wide area network, or WAN. A WAN might connect a remote sales office to corporate headquarters across the country or across the world. A WAN might also connect your home network to the Internet. We discuss several different WAN technologies and the network components used to interconnect LANs later in this course. But before we can start discussing the details about the different network components used in LANs or WANs, we need to understand how information created by an application on one computer gets to an application on another computer. We'll start by examining a similar network model in the next section.
Think about the last time you mailed a letter. How does the post office actually route the letter to its destination? In many ways, computer networks work on the same principles as the post office. Let's look at this in more detail. Imagine you've written your friend a letter. You put it in an envelope and address the envelope. If you examine the address closely, you'll notice it is written in a hierarchical format, starting with the most specific information, your friend's name, followed by the street address, and ending with the postal code, which is the most general information. The post office needs each different level or layer of information to route the letter to its final destination. Once you address the letter, you drop the envelope in a post office box and the mail carrier picks up the letter and takes it to the nearest post office. All this may seem very obvious, and really it's analogous to the steps involved in writing and sending an email. Clicking the send button is the equivalent of dropping it in the mailbox. It's at the post office though, the entrance to the network in this analogy, where we're going to focus our attention. The post office sorts the envelopes by destination using the postal code, the most general information in the address. Your letter is placed into a container and sent to the next post office along the route to its destination, where the letter is put into another container and the process is repeated until it reaches the final post office. Notice that the envelope might be placed into several different containers along the way, but the address on the envelope is never changed. Another key point is that the first post office doesn't usually use the entire postal code, just the first few digits. As the envelope makes its way from post office to post office toward the final destination, the sorting equipment looks at additional digits. Eventually, the entire postal code is used, and all the mail in the container has the same postal code and is destined for the same post office. Once there, it's then sorted again based on more specific information, the street address, for the mail carrier to deliver. Only when the envelope is delivered to the correct house is the recipient's name examined because more than one person might reside at that same address. Computer networks work in much the same way. We'll cover this topic in more detail later. But in short, like handing off letters and packages from post office to post office, networks forward packets of data from one device to another until, like the final post office, the final device forwards the data to the destination computer. To understand networking, it helps to start thinking in layers. In fact, a model was developed many years ago to break up the complex process of sending data from one computer to another into seven steps or layers. Called the Open Systems Interconnection, or OSI, reference model, this model identifies the steps and functions that must be completed at each layer when computers communicate over a network. These seven layers are like a set of building blocks stacked on top of each other. In fact, the seven layers combined are often referred to as a network stack. The OSI model, however, provides only guidelines on how computers communicate over a network. It does not provide detailed procedures on how to actually make this communication happen. These procedures for communication are called protocols and define how actual communication occurs. A protocol is a formal set of written rules or procedures that computers must understand, accept, and use to be able to talk to each other over a network. Different protocols are used at different layers of the reference model. Just as two people need to speak the same language to communicate, two computers must use the same protocol at the same layer for the data to be communicated. More than merely a common language, protocols are like the rules of etiquette frequently encountered among spoken languages. When you start a conversation, you usually say hello and wait for the other person to greet you. You typically take turns talking and asking questions. Network protocols operate in the same manner, defining rules such as when computers are able to transmit data, which computer the data is destined for, and what to do if the data is not received. The OSI reference model also describes how data should be passed from one layer to the next. On the sending computer, 
data flows down the model or stack. At each layer in the stack, protocols add headers and trailers or footers, which contain information such as addressing and error control information. When a lower layer receives information from an upper layer, it considers the entire package's data and adds its own header and, if needed, footer or trailer to the data. The process of adding headers and footers to data layer by layer is called encapsulation. On the receiving computer, data flows up the stack. At each layer, the addressing or protocol information is examined and removed layer by layer until the computer gets to the actual data. The process of removing headers at each layer of the stack is called de-encapsulation. The OSI reference model is theoretical in nature and, as we mentioned earlier, does not define actual protocols. The Department of Defense and the Internet Engineering Task Force developed a simpler four-layer model called the TCP-IP reference model. This model defines specific protocols at each of the four layers, such as TCP and IP, two of the Internet's core protocols. A group of network protocols that work together is called a protocol suite or a protocol stack. So the protocol suite that governs Internet communication is commonly called the TCP IP protocol suite and is based on the TCP IP reference model. The name is a bit misleading because TCP and IP are only two of dozens of protocols that make up the suite. Let's take a moment to compare the two reference models. On screen, you'll see both side by side. The first difference you'll notice is that the first three layers of the OSI reference model fold into a single layer in the TCP IP reference model, simply called the application layer. The transport and network layers map directly between the two models. The TCP IP reference model merges the lower two layers into the network access layer, which focuses on how data is transmitted over any type of physical network, regardless of whether it's a LAN or a WAN. The TCP IP model is not concerned with the details of this layer and uses existing standards, such as Ethernet or ATM. We cover these technologies later in the course. In practice, however, many people discuss TCP IP based networks using a five layer model that is a combination of the four layer TCP IP model and the seven layer OSI model. This commonly used networking model uses the first four layers of the OSI reference model. You'll notice that where the TCP IP model combined the original OSI data link layer and the physical layer into a single layer called the network access layer, this model breaks them back out. At the same time, like the TCP IP model, this model collapses the OSI model's application, presentation, and session layers into one layer, referred to as the application layer. Although there are only five layers in this model, the layers are commonly referred to using the original OSI numbering scheme. Layers 1 through 4 are the lower layers, and layer 7 is the application layer. This course uses this commonly used hybrid networking model. We cover each of its layers in more detail in a moment.